Good evening once again. Welcome to Politically Incorrect. Let me introduce you to our panel. Right over here we have Jean Sassen. Did I say that correct? You said it right. Okay. You are, of course, the best-selling author of the Princess Trilogy and your latest Esther's Child. Go uh, back no. to the Just PR take take it. Oh. Well, well the let PR. the lady talk. Please. She's been trying. Uh, <laughs> with the PR war that you were talking about, we certainly won't, will, will not win. I've been 23 years in the Middle East, and I can tell you what will win it, and that is after justice is served, which I'm for that like everybody, after justice is served, we have to go in there and let them see the real face of America, not tell them about us, not send messages. What we is have it? Arab Corps. We need an Arab Corps like we had a Peace Corps. We need to go into Lebanon. Oh, we I need to go it. in and help with infrastructure. We need to, we need to make sure these people, that we, we can do a whole host of things. We yes. can also so with Egypt, uh, it's such a complex country, but I am so tired of them taking $2 billion a year and unleashing their poison on us in the media. I've been there, I've heard it, and I've seen it. Right. So that we have to stop that. So we have to have a, a list of things to do. I'm preparing a plan. And it is poison. Yes, Al Jazeera absolutely. is poison. You... All right. Gene, we've all been shouting and not letting you Thank speak. You. And we might as well be the Taliban. We might I, well I was beginning to think yeah. I right. needed to exactly. bring Exactly. This is as you? bad as it is. <laughs> Put that hair in, over your face. In Kabul. Yeah. So, uh -huh. and, and you are the one uh, who was, you lived 23 years, you said? I've been in the Middle East in for 23 Middle years, East. 12 in Saudi Arabia. I can speak on that really well. Well, tell us. I mean, I said the other night, I said mm -hmm. twice on this show, Saudi Arabia is the center of Islam, mm -hmm. and twice... People from the Middle East. People denied it, and I was laying in bed at home saying, You're kidding. Ex I can't believe I you're saying that. Of course, I mean, it isn't centered. You know how it's a It's not the center? It, it of is course, the center it isn't. Of Islam. It is. It most certainly there is. There is a Mecca holy... and Medina, it most certainly is the center. Are you the all, holy where do you sides. face they, when you pray? I don't pray. The you holy pray. sides. Uh, I, I, I hate to disappoint you. Yeah. The, because you stereotype. You think all Muslims pray 24 hours a day, right? No, five times a day. That's okay. We're not making fun of it. We're just saying you face. Saudi Mecca. Arabia. The ones who pray face Mecca, right. not the government of Saudi Arabia, which came well, we out in this country. That. We said we Saudi Arabia. The population Arabia. of Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia is less than 1% of all world's Muslim. In addition to that, right. the government of Saudi Arabia is one of the most sexist, misogynist, exclusivist country in the world. I don't have a problem and have with only that. lasted because of your government's support for it. Not and necessary. let me tell you this, it is more detested among Arabs and Muslims than by non-Arabs and non-Muslims. It right. is now. And if you it want was to help, not in 1978. And if you want to help Assad, Arabs and Muslims, somebody, you will, instead of the propaganda war you're now hiring highly paid consultants for, you would help the Arabs to fight the war for democracy against the royal family, many of the members of which have surreptitiously have supported Bin Laden have and his government. Have you lived government. in Saudi? Who would have take over Saudi? the Saudi royal family have fell? Have you lived well, well, there? I want to know if you lived there. Let her talk about Saudi. Have you lived in Saudi? Uh, the answer is no. Have you visited Saudi? The answer is no. Okay. I was there for 12 years. I lived in a Saudi neighborhood. I knew Good the for people you. for the royal family all the way down to the Bedouin. And I'm telling you What's that at, up until 1990, the mm -hmm. people in Saudi Arabia did not mind their government. It only, there was the go go That's years. So I, 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 so no, no, no. I knew them. There's I talked no to them on a daily no basis. basis. I, no basis. I, I have to say something. All the Saudi people. It doesn't matter if he lived it? there or not because he's lived in America and I think he's misrepresenting so he America know too. I about the real Saudi. I'm telling you, I do. I'm saying it doesn't I'm matter that he lived there. Now, today, they hate their government. Yeah, they yeah. did and, not hate it oh, in 1990. And why is that? Because after the war was over and the soldiers remained, it wasn't just that. It was right. the fact the money ran out. So the Saudis did not want, the government did right. not want them mad at them. So they blamed it on us and said they charged us too much to, to come here and protect us. And you can't have any more money. You can't have any more infrastructure. You can't have any more loan without interest. You can't have these things. And then all the people, when it hits their pocket... Right. Suddenly they weren't happy. I was in Kuwait. Right. Same thing happened there. The Emir came back. They were all mad, ready to have the vote. I was right there with the celebrations. They, they handed them $100,000 for each, each Kuwaiti male who stayed during the war. <laughs> right. And they never said another Basically, word. Basically, their, their dot-com bubble burst. Yes. That's and what happened. Our soldiers, first, are we forgetting why our soldiers were there to begin with? To, to save their butts! We, oil, oh, please. Oil, we're there to guard oil. our oil. Uh, so if you, for example, prevent the sale of wheat to Iraq, which you do, it means Iraq because it needs for its livelihood some wheat for the bread. I want to shock everybody and agree with the United on States? one thing, if Go I ahead. might. The, in Iraq, the sanctions, you should drop it. I agree. I was there. To stupidest no, Cuba. Say, have you been to Iraq? No. I was in Iraq last summer. <laughs> Ooh, okay. I said Cuba, don't burn. No. And let me tell you, it's, it's only around. hurting the children. Of course it and is. And the poor. Of course. We should I have was just... in a hospital right. where two-year-old babies were having chemo because their parents couldn't get I there. Know. And that's yeah, what okay. makes, but what, makes what, what, that angry at the United States. What, what do we do if, if Hussein really does become... Surgical, please. Go in and just get him, get the people that have you. Sanction Saddam. Sanction the regime, not the innocent civilians. Because he's thriving. 
Of He's course doing he is. wonderfully. Right. And the people are the poorest people I have seen right. in a long so time. So if, if we, you know, knock wood, pray, uh, you know, you we do get, we do get the you. okay to do we then continue into? Well, I would. Be they not before I took to this commercial. Us, That's oh. what I would do first, <laughs> and then I go. Coming up, this woman lived and worked in Arab countries for 23 years, and she believes that Miriam could be killed if she's forced to return to her country. We'll talk to her. Now meet Jean Sasson. She will be testifying about what could happen to Miriam if she's sent back to her country. For the past two decades, Jean has lived and worked in Arab country, countries, including Bahrain. Take a look. Jean Sasson has lived in Arab countries on and off for the past 23 years and was appalled when she saw the chilling truth about how so many Arab women were really living. In 1991, after being refused service at a local food stand in Saudi Arabia because she was a woman, she dedicated the next decade of her life to exposing restrictive cultural traditions and shocking human rights violations worldwide. In 1992, Jean says she received death threats after writing her controversial book, Rape of Kuwait, which uncovered the atrocities of the Gulf War. And after becoming close to a royal Saudi Arabian family, Jean also wrote three books based on her secret interviews with an anonymous Saudi princess that detailed the unimaginable restrictions many Saudi women face. So Jean says that Miriam's family is obligated to punish her to restore honor to the family. Is that true? It, it's absolutely true. And seeing Miriam here and Jason, I, my heart feels very broken and I'm just hoping that the INS will not send her back because I believe the family, the, the years that I was in the Middle East, the honor of the whole family now is stained. She has sisters and it's not just her family. Perhaps her father would not be able to pull out a dagger and stab Miriam, but there will be someone in the community, someone in the family that feels that this is not wiped out the stain because Miriam, not only for the country, the family, I mean, she's just exposed a lot of their system. It's been in the news that she wasn't a princess. And if it wasn't in the news, there might be some small chance. But I fear for her if she's forced to go I know, because is this a country yeah. that still believes in honor killings? Well, honor killings are all over the Middle East and in uh, some other countries. More, they're not as prevalent in Bahrain, because Bahrain is a much more modern country mm -hmm. than Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan. But it does happen, and it's very quiet. You don't hear about it. That's right. I only heard about it because I lived in Saudi Arabia. And what is the culture of the women? Do the women have to be veiled? Do the women, I just did V-Day, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the, the piece I did for V-Day, which I didn't, was, a, was, a, was called Under the Burger, was mm -hmm. about the women who have to wear the burgers and sort of, Afghanistan, you know, the, yeah. the, the point of being under the burger is that you have no identity. So you don't have to be veiled. No, I don't have to be. Usually Who I'm, is veiled? What is um, the older um, women or um, the girls who are more religious, mm -hmm. but usually younger girls would just wear jeans and tops. You're allowed to do that. So you fear for her life. Yes, I do. Do you fear for her life if you were to go back? Do you fear for your life? I do. When she told officials she feared going back home, they granted her the right to stay, but only temporarily. There's no way this family cannot punish her severely. How many sisters you got? Jean Sasson writes about the plight of women in the Middle East. Two, and you're sweet to them? She says Miriam had good reason to be afraid. Now she's considered an unclean woman in their society, in the Islamic community. I think she would either be locked away or possibly killed. I really believe that. Live from Washington, this is Talk to America with Carol Pearson. On today's Talk to America, we're going to meet Jean Sasson, an author who writes both historical novels and works of nonfiction. My guest is Jean Sasson, and she grew up in a small town in Alabama, which is the southern, in the southern part of the United States, and then you accepted a job in Riyadh. How much of a culture shock was that, Jean? Well, I grew up in a very conservative part of America, so it wasn't as much of a shock as you might think. So is the Bible Belt, is that? Yes, right. 
Right. Southern Baptist. You got it. No dancing. No, no dancing. movies. Couldn't dance at the prom. I never had a drink. I never had a smoke. Uh, but we did go to movies, thank goodness. And it was just a very conservative lifestyle. So when I went to Saudi Arabia, it was like not as much of a shock as you would think. Women were not allowed to drive. Of course, that was, you know, a little bit difficult. And uh, the women covered themselves. So that was a shock to see these women totally covered in black. And not being able to see someone's eyes is always sort of startling for me. And I dressed very modestly, but that didn't bother me because I had respect for another culture. So that wasn't a problem. So you actually found similarities between your small town. Was it Huntsville, Louisville? Louisville, Alabama, okay. on the border with, uh, with Florida. People know it if you say Panama City, Florida. <laughs> Did you ever expect that you'd end up in Riyadh? I mean, that's so far away Just from Alabama. Just as far-fetched as you could be. It was Actually, I was uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, working in a, a job there, and received this opportunity. And I thought, mm, I'm single, no kids. This sounds like fun. I'll go. And I went and stayed there 12 years. And most people only stay two. Right. And at the time, uh -huh. did you think, okay, this will be fun for a year or two? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My thoughts were exactly, because everyone said, oh, don't go there. They treat women horrible. You don't want to do this. And I found it fascinating. I was always treated very nice myself and remained there a very long time. So you enjoyed it. I mean, mm -hmm to stay there 12 years, you must have made some contacts. Oh, absolutely. Well, I was in a very unique position because the gentleman I worked for at the hospital was King College's cardiologist, and he was a Saudi, my boss. So I met a lot of the royals in the family. Then I met and dated and married a British citizen who just lived in a Saudi neighborhood who had built his own villa. So I lived in a Saudi neighborhood unlike 99.9% .9 of the people who go as expats to live in Saudi Arabia, they live in western compounds and it's discouraged for them to be around the locals. My situation was uniquely different. Because and it's very hard, isn't mm -hmm. it, to break into Saudi society? Completely. Harder now than it was then. When, when I went there in 1978, they were welcoming to the uh, Westerners. Uh, they wanted us to come in and help run their hospitals, teach in their schools. Their women were not educated or working at all at the time, and very few of the men were. So they were very welcoming to us. It was a completely different situation than it is today. Now, in, your, in the area where you live, the mm -hmm. villa where you live, yes. who were your neighbors? Uh, Saudis. So we had Saudi neighbors all around us. So that made it nice. And that enabled you to get to know them on a, on a personal level, too. Amazingly enough, mainly the men, because the wives did not come out. They just do not participate in public life in Saudi Arabia. And the, mainly the women I got to know were through the royal family. And I was invited to their parties, their functions, their weddings, because this is a totally sex segregated society and I would meet the Saudi men at the hospital and then through my husband I met a good many Saudi men the women were more difficult but over time I did meet them and so many of the women who were my friends were Egyptian Jordanian Lebanese Palestinian from other parts of the Arab world who were there living with their husbands who were working in the kingdom so do you think that meeting the women from other parts of the Arab world mm -hmm. was easy because they weren't at home when you're not at home you're always looking to you know, meet interesting people and make friends. Well, I found in the Arab world, and I think Americans are just finding out about this, they knew everything about us. And we knew all, all, absolutely nothing about them. When you say everything, do you mean about our politics and, and uh, major issues, mm -hmm. domestic issues? Well, they're very much immersed in that because we're the superpower. So people always look to us, and we're in their news. And but, it, Sorry. But when you say they knew yeah. everything about us, mm -hmm. do you think that, uh, would you include that their perceptions of American culture were accurate? Not completely. You would have a mixed bag. It's like some people who had traveled here a lot would have a better grip on what our society is all about. But other people who just seen, unfortunately, a lot of the media that we export from Hollywood, it gave them all a very bad opinion. I know the number one thing that people would say to me, they were startled that I didn't drink and I didn't smoke and I didn't run around on my husband. But you know, Carol, the thing that shocked them the most was that I called my mother every day on the telephone. And they said, we didn't know Americans love their mothers like that. I said, every American I know loves their mother. She was born into one of Iraq's most well-respected families, but power and prestige could not protect Mayada El Askari from Saddam Hussein's henchmen. In a matter of minutes, she went from being a successful businesswoman to becoming a prisoner and a victim of unspeakable torture. Her ordeal is chronicled in the new book, Mayada, Daughter of Iraq. 
She joins me now with the author of that book, Jean Sasson. Welcome to both of you. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. Thank you. Mayana, uh, when were you arrested? What year and why? I was arrested on the uh, 19th, uh, on the 19th of uh, July, 1999, and uh, I owned a, a printing uh, shop. There was a general sweep because of leaflets being uh, uh, distributed in the area where I had my shop, and uh, I was uh, arrested. Uh, and, and on, uh, yes. And, and after the arrest in July of 1999, how long were you held? Three, uh, three weeks. What happened during that three weeks? Well, I, uh, I uh, saw what was happening inside the prison. Uh, I was tortured uh, once. Uh, it wasn't uh, as bad as uh, the uh, other women that were with me. It was a, a, s a very small cell, uh, something that uh, could accommodate only uh, eight women. It, uh, we were 18 women in this uh, s tiny, tiny cell. And uh, ev every day, people were tortured. Uh, we were, you know, we were hearing the uh, voices of pe people being tortured in the uh, end of the hall. It was uh, terrible. One, one of the women with me in the room uh, was uh, killed during torture. There was a university professor that we saw down the hall. Again, he, he got killed during torture. It was horrific, uh, something, you know, you, you had no idea that uh, these things were really, really happening in your country. Jean, now, how did you meet uh, Mayara? I went to Iraq in 1998. Um, I met her as my translator. We became fast friends, and we kept in very close contact for uh, the next year. And then one day, Mayada just disappeared. And then it took me a while to find out what had happened to her. And of course, that was horrifying to know that she was in prison and what had happened to Mayada, this gentle, kind, sweet woman, the last person on earth you'd expect to be arrested. Jean, so, uh, so what, why the book? Well, there's so much about Mayada and her life, her grandparents, her two grandfathers who helped form modern Iraq, and then she saw everything about Iraq, Greta, from before Saddam, during Saddam, after Saddam. So you can't get a better picture of Iraq from the palaces to the torture chambers than through her life story. And I think that everybody really would like to hear about what not what rent went on, but at the same time, uh, with Mayada and what's happening now in Iraq, and so we we let people know that she was um, she's an Iraqi who's very glad that Iraq is free, Saddam is gone, and she can tell us exactly why we should all be glad. Mayada, did uh, I mean you you met Saddam Hussein? Um, you know, what were your thoughts about him? Well, in the uh, beginning, I mean, uh, it was uh, he was rewarding me for my. Uh, um, my journalistic uh, um, uh, writings and uh, stuff, and uh, he was very charismatic. Uh, most Iraqis liked him very much, and uh, the real mask uh, that uh, you know the, that uh, covered the face had not fallen off yet. Uh, I mean, it was yet to come. So uh, he was he was very well liked uh, at the time, but eventually uh, we we saw we we knew what he was, uh, or we discovered what he was. But it took some time. And, and when you were, after the three weeks that you were uh, in custody, or that you were under arrest and, and the one incident of torture, where did you go when you were released and how did you happen to be released? Um, my uh, mother happened to be a, a big government official. She was at the time uh, uh, in Jordan. My uh, kids called her and uh, she called the uh, fourth man in the uh, deck of cards. Uh, you have uh, uh, General Abd Hamoud and uh, he talked to Saddam and uh, Saddam ordered my release uh, on condition that I stay in Iraq I, I do not leave uh, but uh, of course I, 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 I was able to escape uh, if, if there's if there's one word to describe uh, your thought when Saddam uh, fell from power what is it man if there's one word well, sheer gladness I'm sure all right uh, thank you uh, both good luck on the book I appreciate joining me tonight thank you so much Önök Frey Tamás műsorát látják, izgalmas kalandokról, érdekes emberekről és drámai pillanatokról. A helyszín ma este a világtól elzárt Saudarábia, ahol legutoljára másfél évvel ezelőtt járt tévékamera. Íme tehát a műsor, melyben a riporter Frey Tamás. Ezúttal Szaudarábiából. De csadorban, csadorban pihegnek és várnak. A fájtlat csak otthon a lakásban vehetik le. A férfiak mindeközben tombolva élvezik a gazdag életet, négy feleség, ágyasok, márványpaloták, bár a vallásuk tiltja, mégis rengeteg alkohol és állítólag sok-sok kábítószer is. 
Szaudarábia. Egy ország, egy királyság, ahol a férfiak eddig csendben a világtól elzárva élték bűnös életüket, melyet végül, ilyen a sors, egy nő leplezett le. A szaudi királyi család egyik hercegnője. Titokban ugyanis elmesélte a sorsát ennek az amerikai írónőnek, aki ezt felhasználva könyvet írt Szaudarábia és a királyi család színfalak mögötti igazi, kapzsi és erkölcstelen életéről. A világ jelenleg talán legsikeresebb könyve. Sok-sok millió példányban kelt el a leleplezés. 52 nyelven adták ki a könyvet, melynek címe ma már fogalom a világban a hercegnek. A szaudi titkosszolgált azóta sem tudta kideríteni, hogy pontosan ki is ő. Az írónő fejére viszont vérdíjat tűzött ki a felháborodott szaudi király, de mint látják, a hölgy még él. Ismerkedjenek hát meg vele. Jean Sesson, 53 éves, Amerikában, Atlanta külvárosában él. Az utcán a fejére kitűzött 5 millió dolláros vérdé miatt már hónapok óta nem járt. Házát, melynek címét szigorúan titokban tartja, fegyveres biztonsági örök védik. Az írónő éveket élt Szaud Arábia fővárosában, Riyadban. A csinos, szőke amerikai nőt ugyanis 20 évvel ezelőtt titkárnőjél választotta egy szaudi herceg, aki a királyi Fejszál kórház igazgatója volt. Hogy az amerikai szépség elcsábította-e a herceget, nos erről nem szól a fáma. Egy viszont biztos. A szaudi herceg gazdag, arisztokrata körökbe vezette be Jean-t Riyadban, ahol ő egyszer összetalálkozott regénye későbbi főhősével, a hercegnővel. Egy követségi fogadáson pillantottam meg a hercegnőt, aki akkor húsz éves volt, és gyönyörű. Ott állt a terem egyik sarkában, és nem tudtam levenni róla a szemem. Én a tökéletes ellentéte voltam. A 30-as éveim közepén jártam, hosszú szőke hajjal, minden porcikámban, amerikai mentalitással. Azonnal kiszúrtuk egymást, és amikor oda mentem hozzá, rám nézett a hatalmas csokoládé szemeivel, és a szaudi nőkre célozva azt mondta, Ugye milyen nevetségesek vagyunk. Én nem jutottam szóhoz a döbbenettől, még soha nem hallottam szaudi nőt így beszélni. Ott állt mellette a férje, és a hercegnő egy lekezelő mozdulattal feléjeintett, és kijelentette, amíg ezek a buta és nagyképű férfiak irányítják ezt az országot, semmi óra nem számíthatunk. És azzal eltűnt a teremben. Az amerikai írónő a Szaudarábiában töltött évek folyamán sokszor találkozott a hercegnővel, aki állandóan győzködte, írjon könyvet a szaudi arab nők tarthatatlan és megalázó helyzetéről. A hercegnő végül egy döbbenetes történet elmesélésével győzte meg Jean sesson arról, hogy akár mekkora is a kockázat, könyvet kell írnia Szaudarábiáról. A hercegnőnek volt egy nagyon kedves barátnője, aki még nem ment férjhez, és az ottani erkölcsök szerint nagyon szabados életet élt. Rendszeresen találkozott külföldi férfiakkal, és ezt az apja egy idő után már nem volt képes elviselni. A szaudi társadalomban úgy tartják, hogy a család becsületén esett foltot. Csak The Princess Trilogy contains the astonishing true stories of the Arab princess, Princess Sultana. Millions of read her story, now you can too, through this never-before-offered trilogy. Hi, I'm Jean Sasson, author of the Princess Trilogy. Women from around the world have told me that these books open their minds and change their lives. And I promise, these books will change your life too. Every girl at school is reading the Princess Trilogy. I changed my college major after reading these books. After 9-11, I read the Princess Trilogy and discovered what really happens to women in that part of the world. Now I want to help. The Princess Trilogy can change a life. Do it for yourself. Do it for someone you love. I thank you, and Princess Sultana thanks you. And that is exactly what happened when American author Jean Sasson collaborated with a Saudi princess named Sultana in her first book called Princess and her latest one called Princess Sultana's Daughters. Ms. Sasson, good morning. Thanks good morning, so much for Kate. joining us. You, you know, to understand sort of this novel or this mm -hmm. book, you have to appreciate and understand your first one. Yes, so I think that's So briefly right. tell me how Princess came about. Well, I lived in Saudi Arabia for 12 years. While I was there, I met a very unusual princess because I think the, the whole issue of this book being so unusual is the story of a woman in Saudi Arabia. I wrote the first book, Princess. There was worldwide attention given to the plight of women in Saudi Arabia along with the Gulf War. And after that, the, we decided to do Princess Sultana's Daughters, carrying on into the next generation. What's 
happening after the war because Americans are interested in that area right now. Now, both of these book, books focus on a real princess. That's right. Correct? And I think that's why it's so unusual. A lot of people live in the area, come out and tell their stories, but this is her story. It has nothing to do with me. It's the story of her life and what it's like behind the veil, what it's like to live in Saudi Arabia, to be a royal princess, but still have all these restrictions. Your money means nothing. Before we get to the restrictions, mm -hmm. wasn't it incredibly risky for this woman to confide in you and for oh, you absolutely. to tell her story? And what kind of repercussions have there been? Oh, absolutely. It was very frightening. As a matter of fact, we discussed it for eight years before I took pen in hand. We went through the issue a long time. And I was very concerned about her more than me because I could leave, whereas that's her country. She has to live there. If a Saudi princess flees, they'll come and get her. And with the money that the government has, there'd be no protection. So she's an extremely brave woman, and that's what we have to remember, the risk she's taken. And we went to great lengths to try to alter the information. Every story is true, but we tried to make so sure that she couldn't be traced directly. And thus far, the last I heard, she's still undiscovered, except in her immediate family. And the immediate family would never admit to it because that's it would mean right. they had lost control over Absolutely. Her. There's no, a man who's is, is thought of nothing if he can't control control as women. So in turn, that has sort of protected her and her family, even though she has a father that would, has been very cruel to her and a brother, and they'd probably happily turn her over if it wasn't for the reflection on their own honor. Give people a brief idea what it is like to be a woman in Saudi Arabia. Very repressive. First, think about going out every day covered with a veil and a body. You can't see. Everything is uh, taken on a completely different hue, covered in black. You're not allowed to drive. The only work that you can do is pro approved by the government, which is work away from men. We couldn't be sitting here today, Katie, that's for sure, because there are men around us. They try to keep men and women totally segregated. And even in the school, the girls are taught by women only. If there's a course that only men can teach, it's on video. They can't even get in that sort of contact. You go to a Saudi house, the men are in one side, the women in another. I was always put with the women and my husband at the time was put with the men. So it's a total segregation of life from men because they believe that women are so weak that if we're around men, we're going to do something very wicked. Do women object to this? Uh, well, the educated class very much so. They think it's utterly ridiculous. And the princess is a very educated woman. But it's, it's sort of the basis of this is derived from the Quran. So every time the women say, hey, this is ridiculous, I want to do this or I want to drive. seen a sacrilegious. That's right. And so then they can be punished very severely because then the men say you're going against the Quran, which is not true. The, the customs are much more restrictive than the religion. Well, you take sort of a look into the future as you, you sort of chronicle Sultana's mm -hmm. daughters mm -hmm. and, and also her son. Mm -hmm. Is there hope that maybe things might change through these figures? Well, I think so, because women like Sultana, who are educated, are trying to raise their children to go down a different path. Her son is very enlightened. The only problem is we see a wave of Muslim fundamentalism crossing the whole Arab world. Right, and which the women one of her daughters has target. embraced. That's right. She has one, here's a woman who's fought her whole life for women to discard the veil. And I think all mothers can identify with this. Her daughter's gone the opposite, completely covered in the black gloves, the black leggings much more strict than Sultana was even raised. So she's got one daughter going away and one the other, and she's trying so hard to bring her daughters out to realize they're as good as any man. And she sees a lot of hope, I know, in her son. Covered by a black veil, the women of Saudi Arabia live their lives in secrecy and in hiding. And most of these women exist from day to day, year to year, their misery unspoken, their unhappiness never seen. Well, Princess, the true story of life behind the veil in Saudi Arabia takes an in-depth look at the, the days of a female member of the Saudi royal family. And author Jean Sasson has brought us that story, and she joins us today. This is quite a story. Uh, it has been described by some of the reviewers as a page turner, a chapter mm -hmm. turner, whatever it is. It is because one can hardly believe that this sort of thing exists these days, much less in an ally of yes. this country and the West. Unfortunately, that's true, and I think that's been the shock for most people because it is such a conservative, secluded society that unless you go there and see it with your own eyes, you can't imagine that it would exist. And because there's no such thing as a tourist visa to Saudi Arabia, you have to be one of the people who go there to work. You have to be Otherwise, invited by the royal family, effectively. Well, is that right? well, you have to have a sponsor, okay. a Saudi sponsor, mm -hmm. essentially. So people who've gone there to work in hospitals or as teachers have seen what goes on in Saudi Arabia and what happens with these women. I do 
want to add one little thing before we get started. Mm. This really isn't a blanket condemnation of every single Saudi. I've known a lot of nice Saudi men, and I've known happily married Saudi women. This is a story of one Saudi princess, the things that happened in her life, the, her friends, her relatives, and it just so happened that she's a person who had a father who was very domineering and really cruel. A sister married off really for economic reasons to an old man, sexually abused, and had a friend who was drowned for meeting with Western uh, men. So it's a lot of horror stories, but you also get a glimpse of other things, the life behind the veil, what the life of a Saudi royal is like, and see that these rules and regulations affect even the highest women. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply just to like Bedouin women, it's to every woman in Saudi Arabia. I think everyone got a little glimpse through the curtain during the Gulf War mm -hmm. because there were journalists for the first time in Saudi Arabia and of course now there are no more journalists mm. <laughs> in how Saudi it, Arabia. How does it compare in, in Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. the women and their status mm -hmm. and their lifestyle to those other Middle Eastern countries? Okay, well you really need, they're so different. Every mm -hmm. country is unique. Like in Egypt, women have been working for a long time but they're going backward now okay. uh, because of the fundamentalist movement. Uh, in Algeria, you know, they almost had an overthrow of the government. A, a, a couple of women have been burned to death by their brothers for working as a nurse. In Saudi Arabia it is, to get to your question Becky, it is much more conservative, much more secluded because it's the home of the Prophet. They, they consider themselves the upholders of the Muslim faith. They're ruled by the Quran. So Saudi Arabia is much more conservative than practically any other Arab land that is Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard a lot of things that happened in Iran because they, their women were very educated and then things, you know, got Went jerked back. back. Right. Mm -hmm. But in Saudi, I have to say this in the defense of the government, they are ensuring that their women are becoming very educated and this is going to be their trouble mm -hmm. because you can't educate women and then expect them not to use their talents. It starts them to thinking. And the power They're, of knowledge that they've been able to. Absolutely. Attain. And they come here and they see things and they, they used to be able to come to abroad to be educated, but that stopped when I was there, King Khalid, because of, you remember the story of the death of a princess where the princess was put to death mm -hmm. uh, by having an affair? Mm -hmm. After that happened, because she had met her lover at a university abroad, and after that, King Khalid passed a law that no more women would be allowed to go abroad and study without a male member of their family living with them. But the women are becoming educated. I, I did see changes. I went there in the 1970s. Changes came quite rapidly. We thought we were going to see women take off the veil, women start to drive, but that didn't happen because of the fall of the Shah the Mecca uprising, all of these things, the fundamentalists now in Saudi Arabia are saying we do not want westernization. Westernization is horrible. Look at the West. They think all, they think every Western woman's a prostitute. Mm. They feel very sorry for us. They think our men don't protect us. And they see this as an honor thing. It's a control of their females. Well, the reactionaries certainly have a, a, the ear of, of those in control there these mm -hmm. days. Um, the suggestion is, well, if, if they are so wealthy and if they are uh, able to uh, get some education and so mm -hmm. why don't they leave? Why don't they get out of this whole That's scenario? That's a good question. So many people have asked me that. But you'd have to understand the culture. And I stayed there a long time before I understood a Saudi woman would find it almost impossible to exist without her huge family unit. The women are very tight. They're very close. And they can be brought back by force. How would they live? There's a story in the book that I told about a, a friend of uh, Sultana's, one of her sister's friends, who did go and work abroad. Her mother and father were very modern thinking. She was their only child. She met, fell in love with an American her parents were killed in an automobile accident. Her father's brother took over the family because in the Middle East, the eldest male takes over whenever mm -hmm. something happens, say, to the father. Then he takes over the children. Well, this man was as conservative as his brother was modern. And so insisted, he insisted she come back. She didn't. She fled. Well, their love affair went awry. She had no way of making a living. She was convinced by the members of her family to go back. She met them in Egypt. She went back into Saudi Arabia. She was married off to an old man immediately. They discovered she was not a virgin. She was brought home in disgrace. And as punishment, she was given what they call the woman's room punishment. She was locked away in a room. Now, this is used like for weeks at the time, say six weeks punishment or a week punishment. Rarely is it. Now, that is unusual this for is life. isolation. Isolation in a dark room. 
uh, no one is allowed to speak to you, not even the servants. They pass the food through a little hole in the, in the door. And uh, this girl was confined until death. She and went mad. Is that the one I was reading? Yes. She the went, woman's room. Is, she yes. eventually went mad. A horrible story. That's the one story that's gotten most people because if you die, if you're killed, if you're stoned, then it's over. Mm -hmm. But if you're locked away in isolation forever, it's that control. Mm -hmm. I still have you. You're under my control. Can you say this is a story of one woman, but yes, uh, you friends. mentioned that this is hardly uh, a, a unique story by any means, though. Unfortunately, it's not. It does happen. I, myself, before I met the princess, I had lived in Saudi Arabia about five years before I met this princess, but I worked in a royal hospital, and we had horrendous things that we knew about from in the hospital, a woman who would come in who discovered she had cervical cancer, to be divorced on the spot by her husband, and he would take the children, she'd never see them again, because he, he has the law to do that, but backing him, he can take the children. So I wasn't so surprised. A couple of things I hadn't heard of, but I questioned, and other people said, well, it happens, but not that often, because they're very good Saudis, they're very happily married Saudis, their girls were treated wonderfully by their fathers, but the thing in Saudi Arabia, there's no law to help you. There's no recourse if no. you're not so lucky. It happens in this right. country. We know things that happen here. A lot of Saudis will say, well, what sure. about your country? I'll say, hey, I'm the first one to agree, but we do have somewhere we can turn. Mm -hmm. You have nowhere to go. No one's going to interfere with the father, the mm -hmm. husband, the brother. They are the law in your lives. This is the uh, true story. Behind the veil in Saudi Arabia, Princess is what it's called by Jean Sassen. It is a page turner and a hair raising one at that. Thank you, Jean. We've got Thank more you, coming up for you in just a moment. We're back. My next princess that we're going to discuss has wealth beyond belief. She has four mansions on three continents. She has her own Learjet, a priceless collection of jewelry, yet she is treated as a slave by her husband. She is a Saudi Arabian princess whose secrets are revealed in this fascinating new book called Princess, the true, a true story of the life behind the veil in Saudi Arabia. Please welcome the author who is a very close friend of the princesses and ask her to please put it all down exactly as it is, Jean Sasson. Yes. Nice to have you on. Thank you. Up with fascination. I had no idea Saudi Arabians in this day and age are absolutely right, uh, slaves to their husbands. I mean, they cannot do anything, go anywhere, have any money, well, nothing, with all that wealth. Well, you're in a society where men totally control the whole society. And with that in mind, then everything is dictated by the men in their life. So if they have a husband who doesn't want to relinquish control, then there you go. Okay. They're directly under their thumb. What are their childhoods like? We're talking now about princesses. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't are want to... Are they educated? Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, they do educate their women now. They say they want them to be better mothers and to be able to raise their children under the Quran. So in mind, they have educated them, but that's causing some problems. Because... Yeah. Uh, if you have education, but they can't go out and work. Can a princess go out and work? Well, I have never known a princess to work out in society. I have known some merchant class women, which we would call our middle class, okay. who do go out and work as pediatricians or gynecologists or teachers, but only with women because the whole society is so totally segregated. And every woman from the minute she gets a period uh -huh. has to put on the veil that I wore yes. at the start of the show. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, husband puberty. never sees it without it? Uh, well, when she marries, she generally has not. It's an arranged marriage. Everything in Saudi even Arabia is now, even now, now. Absolutely, even now. Well, Sultana was different because she got to meet her husband before the marriage under an arranged meeting with his mother and aunties and that sort of thing. But that's very rare. Every now and then they allow them to exchange photographs. But they say marriage is absolutely too important to leave to the youth of the country. And the husband is allowed to have, even to this day, how many married? Uh, uh, Four wives. Four wives. Yes, has to treat them all equally. So that's sort of letting the middle class out of this uh, uh, so-called um, Quran that is dictated to them because the middle class cannot afford four wives because you have to treat them equally, build four mansions, have to buy four diamond necklaces, four cars, four drivers, uh, four of everything. So you see a lot of the, the Al Saud family, which is the royal family, right. you'll see they have four wives and you'll see the better one because they just have to pitch a tent. So it's pretty easy to have four wives under those so circumstances. So you're very poor, very rich. Yes, but the middle class, the middle not class. so much. What about but, women sexually? I mean, um, uh, tell what they do to the women. Uh, the circumcision. The circumcision. Well, this is something that is quite common, actually, in the Muslim world. They say, like in Africa, it's like 85% uh, and in Egypt Still. also. Yes. In Saudi Arabia, it tends to be dying out a little. Sultana's older sisters were circumcised, but she was spared this 
really awful practice. It's women do it to women. And I found from the Western doctors that I spoke to and also from Sultana's story that it is the mothers that keep this practice going what more than the fathers. What does circumcision do? Uh, well, it um, relieves the woman of her um, clitoris. So she has no sexual Yes, yeah, so they enjoyment. say she has no sexual desire. That probably happened to me. I didn't know. <laughs> I learn something every day on this show. <laughs> Tell me about um, what the rules are so strict. Uh -huh. There's one scene. This, this book is fascinating. There's one scene where she had um, seen. I talk as showbiz. Uh, she had the girlfriends that went out. They were so frustrated. They picked yes, up men but left their yes. veils on. Yeah, absolutely. They went out picking up foreign men, which they, I think when everything is prohibited, people tend to do things that they shouldn't do. So these girls were picking up foreign men and going out and just having so-called fun with them, yeah. uh, even though they remained virgins when they were discovered. Because they have committees in Saudi Arabia. They're called the Morals Committees. They roam the streets to make sure no one is committing any act that they deem that they shouldn't do. So they grabbed these women and found that they were getting in the van with uh, two men, Syrian and Lebanese, and they took these women, put them in jail. Uh, they checked them. They were still virgins. They, uh, they said they had done nothing, that they had just accepted a ride, but as it was, the fathers were the ones who, it's, it's a shame on their family. So in order to erase the shame to his honor, the more modern, liberal-minded father of one of the girls, one of Sultana's friend, put her to death by drowning her in the family swimming pool uh. and had the whole family to watch. And I don't want to say this is something that goes on daily, but the man has the power to do that because in the Arab world, if your honor has been, if your daughter has done something, it's always sexual misconduct. Always. It, yeah, always. And if your honor has been tarnished, then the only way to rid your name of the shame is to kill the offender. We want to go to commercial, mm -hmm. and then we'll come back, and I want to talk about, can they ever get away from this? We'll be back in a moment, so stay tuned. <laughs> with Jean Sasson hearing the shocking details of the life of a Saudi Arabian princess. And it, the lives are so terrible and so strange. Mm -hmm. Once the women get married, the men can divorce by just going, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Can a woman get a divorce? She can by the Quran, but it's a very uh, difficult affair, and a group of men will determine whether or not she has a case, if the man is impotent or if he can't provide for her. And they might come back and say, well, you might not like a thing for which Allah has will good for you, so you have to stay. So, so it, it's very difficult for a woman to get a divorce, even though it's possible. Now, why did they run away? Like well, this, that's this, a this, very this, good question. I read yes. this princess's mm -hmm. life, I thought, mm -hmm. what the hell is she hanging around for? Well, if you understand the Arab culture and mentality at all, they could not imagine existing without their families. They're so close-knit in spite of these things. They like to work through problems. It wouldn't enter their mind to run away and live in the West. Like we would say, hey, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. But it doesn't happen that way in the Middle East. It's very rare. But they do live a lot in the West. They do they come, come in visit a lot yes. yeah that's that's true they come and shop and I've been with Sultana on shopping trips in what Europe what's that like what are some of the compensations for this lousy life well um, they took away your clitoris <laughs> what has she got in return well she's got an awful lot of money all right and she can buy anything she pleases she has servants at her beck and call uh, she is able to fly anywhere she wants to at a whim because she has a husband who does allow her to go and come a little bit different and um, I guess that's about it. I mean, she's educated, but she's bored. When you she's say, all the time bored. When you say so, uh, money, what, like you've been on shopping sprees, what were some of the yeah. things you've seen that I just go in and buy? Well, I was with her in Monaco, actually, brought to my mind when your other, your previous guest, and she went in and, and decided she wanted this necklace, and she has an Egyptian man who goes with her to pay for everything. She doesn't carry money. He's an Egyptian keeper of the books, and uh, she bought a necklace for $2 million, just like that. Just, just like, like that. She decided she wanted it, and she thought nothing of it. Did she at least bargain it down from 2 8 Well, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so they, she could say to her husband, she left like that. that for two million. What are you yelling at me for? She left that to the Egyptian. She said, I want this, and the price was approximately $2 million. And then we left and went on to other things. And she got that. Yes. What, what's their social life like? Once they're married, are they allowed to see other men? Are they allowed to participate in like mixed well, parties, mixed dinners? Generally, only in the immediate family. With Sultan and Kareem, they were what she would call wild because they Kareem would entertain. Her yes, her husband. Mm -hmm. They would entertain within the home, which is very unusual in Saudi Arabia. And the Batawas, which are the religious men, did not like it. But she was able to get away with it being royalty. But generally, no. I've been to parties in the Middle East. In Saudi Arabia, the women are in one room. The men are in the others. Or usually, it's just a woman's party. The weddings are segregated. The funerals the are segregated. Everything is segregated. The women 
women dance together. They perform for one another. They dress for one another. There's a, it's unbelievable because they can only impress one another with gorgeous clothes and diamonds. Never men. So you mean, as long as they live in Saudi Arabia, no man could ever see another man's wife That's right. like you. It would, it would be a complete insult to well, that man. What happens when they go to America and they bump into each other in a restaurant? Well, it's in America. They say when you can't be seen by your own people, you can do anything. There's so, no shame attached to that. And they, they come to America, wear very sexy clothes, and go shopping and live the Western life. And they go back to Saudi Arabia and, they, and going through. When we hit Saudi airspace, you see all the Arab women rush to the bathrooms and stand in line and put on the black abaya veil and come out. These gorgeous creatures just a few minutes ago. And when you leave Saudi airspace, leaving, they do the same thing. And they are some of the sexiest women I've ever seen. Well, <laughs> if, again, I, I, which I asked Anne before, um, if you had a chance to be a princess in Saudi Arabia, uh -huh. yes or no? Absolutely no. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> I thank you very much. The book is terrific. When we come back, we're going to meet a real princess who was exiled when she was...